Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy, it only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. Previous guests on the show have included Alan Hirsch, Pam Arland, and Christopher Wright. You could go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Michael Frost. It is so good to have Mike back on the podcast. Michael Frost is an internationally recognized Australian missiologist and one of the leading voices in the missional church movement. Since 99, Dr. Frost has been the founding director of the Tinsley Institute, a mission study center located at Moreland College in Sydney, Australia. He's the author or editor of 19 books, including The Shaping of Things to Come, Exiles, The Road to Missional, and Surprise the World. Mike's latest book is Mission is the Shape of Water, which is what we talk about in this conversation. We also hear how mission has taken different shapes throughout the centuries, but the principles of mission remain the same. We hear incredible stories about the missionaries of the first few centuries after Christ, Boniface and the Celtic movement, Zinzendorf and the Moravians, Mary Slessor and Alice Seeley Harris. We then move into how all of this history impacts our world today. What can we learn, take from, and move on from as we join God in his mission to draw all peoples to himself? Join us as we learn from the past mission to inform our future mission as we join God in his work. Here's my conversation with Michael Frost. Well, Mike, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you back on to Shifting Culture. It's really exciting to have you. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back a second time. Uh, Your new book, Mission is the Shape of Water, is fantastic. It's really good. I love it. My wife loves it. Lots of my friends have already read it. I mean, it's uh, really popular right now in my mission circles. Why do you choose, did you choose the title Mission is the shape of water. What are you trying to express and convey? Yeah, actually, um, I'm not generally very good at uh, titling books. Uh, usually, I submit a, a you know a proposal or a manuscript, and the the publisher will always be like, "Great, looks good. We're gonna have to work on that title." So um, <laughs> it, it's just not my thing. I'm not good with snappy, clever titles. But I think I really nailed it with this one, if I do say so myself. Um, it just it just came to me um, that I mean as I mean I teach a unit in the history of Christian mission at the at the college where I serve and uh, it just came to me that uh, as we look at the history of Christian mission throughout the eras and around the world in different contexts mission is shaped very very differently in different contexts and so I mean I didn't come up with the the phrase the shape of water that comes from a, a film you might be familiar with um and in that film the kind of the inference is that love is the shape of water so love takes many different kind of forms but it's kind of riffing off that title of the movie i thought well so is mission mission takes many different forms it's shaped in different ways in different contexts and yet its essential properties don't change i mean water is h2o if where, wherever you find it, it could be in your bottle, it could be in the Caspian Sea, it could be you know in a, a, a large forty-four gallon drum. It's shaped by the container in which it's placed, and it seemed to me like that is a good way of thinking about mission. It frees us from this idea that it has to look exactly the same everywhere all the time. Uh, it opens us to actually take seriously context. There's nothing wrong with your water being shaped like a bottle or being shaped like a lake. Um, there's nothing inherently you know, concerning about that. It happens to be the context in which it finds itself. So I just thought the phrase kind of, A, it actually did describe the fact that mission does look different everywhere. But B, it's actually a call to take context seriously and to recognize that there's nothing wrong with a particular 
spirit of the age, the particular concerns of a certain time in a certain cultural moment for us to take those things seriously and dare to believe that the mission of God's people could and should respond to those things without its inherent properties being compromised. So I said at the beginning of the book, mission is always about alerting people to the reign of God through both word and deed. That's always the same. Like H2O, that doesn't change. But what that looks like, how that's expressed, in what ways we demonstrate that are are peculiar to the context in which it finds itself. I think that's really important for us to to grasp and know that the context is really important as we move forward, but the principles and the essence of what mission is and what God is doing is the same. Um, and so you you talked about bringing the reign of God into a particular place through the context of the culture and the age that they live in. What are some of those principles that are the same over the ages and the periods that you looked at? Yeah, well, I would say that, not to be pedantic, but I would say that we don't really bring in the reign of God to any particular context, that that really kind of missional people make the assumption that our God reigns everywhere, universally and completely, but that in certain contexts, people's awareness or experience of that reign is impeded or limited or they can't understand it or see it. So I, I don't, I don't want to, I hope you don't think I'm being too picky there. But No, I think that's people, really important. Yeah, sometimes people speak as though we are bringing God into a context. But um, there are some stories in this particular book about how God actually kind of raises up faith in Christ completely uh, separated from or divorced from any contact with Western missionaries or, uh, you know, almost spontaneously, particularly the stories I share come from Africa. So it, like God is at work and God is present and God is sovereign everywhere. But we do go into context. And what we're seeking to do is to help to alert people to that, to help people to see that, to kind of clean the mirrors or clean the glass, uh, the, the window, if you like, to help people to see God's sovereignty in that particular context. So I guess certain principles are the belief in the sovereignty of God, a thoroughgoing understanding of what Scripture and what Christ has told us comprises the kingdom of God or the reign of God. It's very hard not to use old-fashioned words like kingdom or reign, so I will use them, but if you can find better ones or different ones in different contexts, I would suggest that you do. Um that we're not there just to bring the gospel. This is another important thing that I think we need to come to terms with, that so much language, certainly among evangelicals, is that we we are taking God to a place and we are telling people the gospel. And often that has been reduced to um, a description of atonement theories, a certain atonement theory. And so the atonement is part of the good news. But to actually broaden our understanding of the gospel and to recognize actually we're alerting people to the reign of God. I mean, and, and one of the ways to come under that reign, is, of course, is repentance and faith and acknowledgement of God's grace and beauty and kindness and holiness. But uh, it's not as simple as you have a God-shaped hole in your heart and I can help fill it for you. This is really about God is present in this place and God's reign is unfurling throughout the world and throughout history. And we've, we've come to help you to see this. We've come to kind of, well, I mean, we don't even see it fully or completely. Uh, we're even still coming to terms with what this looks like. But we'd like you to join us in this journey of understanding the, the joy and the beauty and the wholeness and the community and the peace and the healing and the, the sense of God's presence that's possible uh, when you come under the rain. So an awareness of, of what the, the full good news is, that the word gospel means good news, but it's the good news of the kingdom. I mean, good news or gospel just describes that it's it's good. Uh, what is it the good news about? It's about the fact that our God reigns beautifully, completely and wholly. So some of those things are essential and important. And then it, it then doesn't become trying to like convert people to our brand of religion. It's about actually opening people's eyes to the grace of God. I love I love that. And I love the holistic gospel of what it looks like. I'm going to read you back to yourself um, from the book. It says, uh, he says, 
this. This is the gospel. Christ is king, as proved by his birth, life, miracles, teaching, death, and resurrection. And a relationship with him invites us into a world of deliverance, justice, peace, healing, community, joy, and ex- the experience of God's presence. As we go out into the world and help unveil the, the kingdom of God that it's that's already there uh, in front of us, that we get to to help in that, that there's all sorts of different ways that that takes shape. Um, and so let's go through some of those shapes that you found uh, in your book. And we could just start with uh, the God slaying shape, which is your chapter one, your first shape. What was happening in those early centuries of Christian mission? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it was incredibly complicated, complex, um, and messy kind of time. But yeah, I say in that early phase, the post apostolic era, church fathers, the kind of very early church, that um, essentially the church was emerging in the context of polytheism. That mm-hmm. not only was there the, the Greco Roman pantheon of gods, which was considered at that time a bit old fashioned by the average person, they were the kind of the old gods, um, you know, all the, all the ones that most people would be aware of, the, the pantheon of gods above us, beyond the blue having orgies and sleeping with each other's sisters and, you know, getting cranky and sending lightning bolts and all that kind of jazz. Even at that time, most kind of Roman citizens were like, yeah, they're, they're, they're old. That's the old fashioned kind of religion, but bursting up all around them at the same time that Christianity emerges was this whole suite of mystery religions or Gnostic religions. And uh, this was the kind of the new knowledge that we, you needed to have to access the gods and the spirits and, and the powers. And so Christianity emerges in the middle of this. And so, you know, I mean, less wise leaders might have thought, oh, well, could you clear a little space on the buffet with all the other kind of new religions plus all the old religions and, like, we'll put Christianity on the on the table too. Like, have a taste of that, you know. He, he's worth looking at. But actually, that's not what they do. Their view is, uh, I'm sorry, like there's only one God. There are no others. Like this, all this old-fashioned religion, we all know that's kind of rubbish anyway, and all these new religions aren't going to help you. So essentially, they are, are sweeping the whole buffet clean. I mean, all the plates and dishes are smashing on the ground, and they're putting the only meal on the table. And it, it is true that you will find that certainly in some of the uh, the apologists, the church fathers, they're pretty brutal about it. They kind of mock and humiliate these other gods. And, you know, they kind of laugh at, the, at, the, at idols and they bang on these wooden things and, oh, I could burn this in my fireplace. And it's not respectful mission as we would understand it. It's not like, well, we want to acknowledge your, your previous faith and we want to be affirming and gentle with that. And I can see connections between our faith and yours. No, uh, uh. it's just like it all goes uh, in order for us to kind of present Christ. So their first step in their approach to mission was to present monotheism. That was the primary thing. Like, let's make one thing clear. There's only one God. Like, and, and at that time, of course, there was an emerging sense, even beyond the Christian church, of this idea of the logos, of this idea of this this one voice or one word or one power that unified the whole universe that was starting to emerge and people were thinking yeah you know the world is so integrated what makes the sun come up at this part of the the east at this time of the year every year and how do my all the trees know to lose their their leaves and and now for them to to burst back to life like you know, we cut down trees, we looked inside, they don't have brains, they don't have machines. How do they know? Like, who speaks to them that they should all operate at the same time? All my sheep give birth to lambs, all pretty much at the same time. Like, how does that order happen? It can't be that there's different gods looking after these different departments, as it were. That it, That's just, it's, it doesn't reflect the integration, the wholeness of the world that I observe around me. Something must speak all of this into the rhythm that I observe. And they didn't know what to call that. Uh, they called it the logos or the word, this this kind of internal logic that kind of kept the sun coming up and constellations moving through the skies. And, and of course, as you, you know, Josh, that 
Christians just seized on this. Well, actually, Jews seized on this first. Like, North African Jews were like, uh, he got it. That's exactly what we think. Except not it's not a, you know, an inanimate kind of voice. That's that's Yahweh. And then shortly after them, you know, the Christians came along and say, you bet. Yeah, the word is Yahweh. And Yahweh took on flesh and walked among us. Let's, let, let us tell you about him. And so there was this sense in which... Um, they did play on some kind of common themes or ideas uh, at play in in the ancient world, but they were also not the least bit patient about about the pagan gods or about polytheism or any of that kind of stuff. So it's like, stop with that, get rid of that. There's only one God, and now let me tell you about how he's revealed himself to us. And, I mean, if anyone ever said, wait a second, I prayed to Zeus and he, you know, my wife gave birth to like triplets and now I've got three sons and you know this is what are you saying it doesn't work um the standard response from the early Christians was oh yeah they that was a that was a deceiving spirit that was tricking you by giving you what you wanted so like there was there was just no truck they didn't allow any any kind of movement there are no other gods but Yahweh or the, the God of the Father of Christ I also do say in the book, I'm not suggesting that we read about that era of history and then say, oh, okay, let's do that. Like, let's go out, like, let's let's go to, you know, some some tribe in, you know, Brazil somewhere and just mock their gods and laugh at them and stamp on their idols. And um, that that is what happened in the first few centuries. But you've got to bear in mind the Christian movement was this nascent, a poor uh vulnerable community speaking out against uh, a dominant structure in the ancient world. Now, if we do it today, it's the reverse. It's Christianity is the dominant structure, which would be stamping on like a small village in Brazil's beliefs. And so one of the things I say in the book is you can't directly say, whoa, that's inspirational. Let's go do that. That was the shape of mission at that time in that context, within the context of an evil, all-pervasive empire, which was crushing the poor and the weak. And Christianity emerges as this counter voice, uh, mocking these, these dominant gods. So I say that's the shape of mission in the first few centuries. Let's acknowledge it and learn about it and draw some inspiration from it. But I don't think that means that the shape today is for Christianity, which has dominated the West, to go out into any other context and do something similar. Yeah, that's good, Mike. That's a really important point. As a Christian in the West, we don't really have a great example of where we are in this biblical story uh, because we have we have power and privilege and yep. uh, we're not this this persecuted minority group that is trying to seek some power, we have the power. Um, and so it does shift and change the way that we engage and encounter mission and what that looks like. So my question is, now that we know that, and now that we have, have gone through you know, some of these, and we'll, we'll go through some of these, but like uh, contextualizing the, the gospel and contextualizing the message what does it look like in the skin of every culture? Now, I think in the imminent frame that we live in now in post Christendom, there is an utter buffet of spiritualities out there. Like the people can, but they're not all about uh, a God that could break into uh, us ourselves to transform us. And sometimes it, it this spirituality of my inner being is there. S any principles that we could take from this era after knowing everything that we know now that would help in a post-Christendom world? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, yeah, as I just said, not the belligerent um, uh, tactics, but I definitely think that there's something very inspirational about the almost triumphant sense of confidence that the earliest church had in the fact that that this kingdom was unstoppable, it's the attitude seems to have been from the writings that I I was reading from this era, uh, is it's just like get on board because 
like this is going to take over the whole world. I mean, it was just utter confidence that that not only was this kind of the, just the most beautiful and sublime way to to be human, to that that this is this is the key to kind of living in a a beautiful redeemed society. This is the key to actually understanding the the the, the secrets of, of 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 the universe and to encounter the, the one true and only God. But um, it was like how this is unstoppable, folks. Uh, I think it's it's. Uh, oh, I was going to say it's Tertullian. I can't remember now which writer it was. Where they're saying, like, I know people who in 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 the the, the court of Caesar. I know people who are becoming Christians there. I know people in the military who are becoming Christians. I know it's almost like everyone's becoming a Christian. Like, come on, join us <laughs> now. Now we can't say that today because it's not true. But I do think something there is something beautiful about a kind of a a serene sense of confidence in the beauty of the gospel, but also in in the plan of God for the world. And I feel as though today we often see a lot of anxiety among leaders, lots of fear about what's happening in the world. Uh, lots of trying to, try to hunker down and kind of bolster the remnant to hold on. It's terrible, but you know we'll, we'll make it somehow. Rather than this kind of real beautiful sense of oh look, you know we might be the minority here in the middle of the Roman Empire, but man, our day is coming. We're just so confident that our God is good, and this gospel is just so beautiful. You, you know, if you knew it, you would want to join in on this. So I think that that's certainly something we can take from that era. I want to talk a little bit about the Celtic Mission Movement uh, and St. Patrick and what did peacemaking mean? Even for us today, we we like to, to enter into justice issues and try to figure out how do we create peace and justice among neglected, marginalized people what did the Celtic uh, missions movement look like and what was peacemaking for them? Yeah, well, back to that kind of robust confidence. I mean, these guys, uh, I mean, Europe had become Christianized and then had fallen back into paganism. And then from these islands, like way up north, like in the icy, miserable regions of the kind of far north of Europe, I mean, what good could come from some way like Ireland or Scotland. <laughs> I mean, that's how the Europeans, would, I mean, that's how the Romans would have seen it. It's just like, what? It's just like a bunch of islands like off the coast. But again, it's from this place. And actually, this is a point that I make in the book is that you know, the first Christianization of the empire comes from Jerusalem and Antioch. Like what? Like like from the far, you know, you know, uh, east of, of, the, uh, of the empire. Like what comes out of there? And then and then the re-Christianization of Europe comes from these islands, you know, to the west or the north. Um, and so, again, it's this kind of unlikely people often are, are raised up by God to bring huge influence uh, in society. The temperament of the, the Hiberno-Caledonian missionaries, today we call them the, these nations, um, Ireland and Scotland, uh, made them incredibly robust, very confident, joyous, big talking, big laughing, uh, song-based culture, lots of beer drinking and carousing, and I mean, just like big, robust, confident, dynamic, fun-loving kind of culture. And when it becomes Christianized, it holds on to a lot of those values. It's not, it's not drunkenness or debauchery, but there's still this kind of incredibly robust sense of uh, of, of joy and confidence uh, in their faith. And so peacemaking for the Celts was very much about moving back into Europe, which had fallen into chaos and was now like overwhelmed by intertribal warfare. Well, sorry, even before I get to that, the Christianization of those parts of, of the UK, as we call it today, was actually about uniting tribes within kind of uh, Ireland and Scotland, um, standing against the, the oppressive power of the, of the Druids or the Druidish kind of leadership of that time, bringing hope and freedom into those contexts, and then training up missionaries in that place, and then moving down, as I said before, into Europe, where intertribal warfare, superstition, darkness. Uh, I mean, it was an oppressive, oppressive, horrible time. And these guys just stride ashore 
in the kind of you know France and and uh, and and Holland and Germany and just bring this incredible robustness. It's just like God is great, Jesus is good, Hallelujah! Stop fighting, let's come together and and uh, and uh, unite together around these common values of the gospel. So one of my favorite Celts, I know a lot of people like uh, Saint Patrick and. Um, although there are so many myths and legends about him trying to find out the kind of truth of St. Patrick is a lot more difficult than most people realise. But uh, I like St. Boniface, who actually was an Augustinian uh, rather than a, a, um, a, a classic Celt, but he was from uh, the north of England. Uh, he turns up and uh, in Frisia, uh, kind of northern Germany, and... Uh, they tell him, oh, we can't follow Jesus because like we worship at this tree. There's this massive oak tree, which they claim this is where Thor came to earth. He landed right there. And where his feet touched the ground, this tree sprung up. So we worship him and we worship at that tree. And anyone who touches that tree will surely die. And he's like, he pulls out an axe and says, let's Let's just test that. And this is sort of classically Celtic mission. It's just like you are living under this fear, this this terror that if you were to offend the gods or this god in particular, that somehow, you know, great sickness would have come upon you or great goblins or ghouls would overcome you or the darkness of the forest would crush you or sickness or disease would, would sweep through you. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. And so he walks up to the tree. Everyone follows him like, oh, my gosh, this crazy foreigner is going to, you know, be struck down by by Thor's hammer or something, and he just starts laying this axe into the tree, and he doesn't die. People are astonished. According to the story, huge wind blows up and like knocks the tree over, so God kind of helps helps Boniface in the end. And everyone's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah!" You know, you must be telling us the truth. And then he says, "Cut up this wood. We'll turn it into a church. He builds a church building out of the wood from the." from the, the donor oak, as it was called, the kind of Thor's, Thor's tree. Now, to me, that story is like classic, where it's sort of, um, it's confrontational, but there's something about Boniface which is just like sort of garrulous and and muscular. Sorry to sound all kind of masculine about this, but there's this kind of sense like, come on, guys, let's give it a shot. You reckon this tree is going to kill you? Well, let's just test it out. And I find something, yeah, as I said, garrulous and, and joyous about that. And as a result of that, they have this incredible strength of like striding into chieftains, you know, tents or homes or huts and saying, right, let's work this out. You're at war with that tribe. This can't can't happen. Um, we need to bring you know freedom and joy to this community. So let's bring these two chiefs together. And you know somehow these tribal chieftains are sort of so overwhelmed by the charisma of these Celtic missionaries. They're like, okay, and he brings them to the table, and they make peace. They bring like literally bring treaties throughout kind of northern Europe, which then opens the possibility for the gospel to seep in. And ultimately they re-Christianize, you know, Western and Northern Europe. I mean, it's a remarkable story. They were remarkable. I, I say they're remarkable guys because mainly they were men who were doing this at that time. What a great story. There's so many incredible stories I wish I had about five hours to talk about all these things, but we don't have <laughs> that much time. So I'm just going to just pick a, a, a few more to talk about before we get into uh, what mission like looks like today and moving forward. Uh, I really want to talk about the Moravians and the Moravian movement. The church that I go to it, and I'm an elder at is affiliated with 24-7 Prayer International. Yep. It was started by Pete Gregg. So Pete Gregg has been really influential order the mustard seed and and all of that which we get a lot of inspiration from the moravian movement on yeah. uh, the prayer movement there uh what did you see with the moravians and count zinzendorf um and one of the the first protestant missions movements yeah well i mean firstly i don't know if it's just baptists or it's protestants generally but they always say william carey was the the father of the modern missions movement uh, and William Carey was getting started in the in the 1790s, um, and no disrespect to William Carey because uh, he was definitely an innovator within 
the British Baptist movement. But yeah, a modern missions, as we would understand it, happened much earlier than that, and through the work of uh, of uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf and the Moravians. And so, yeah, I don't know how many people would would know or don't know this story, but um, Count Zinzendorf was. Uh, his name makes him sound like he's a vampire, but actually he's a uh, part of the um, European aristocracy. And um, But he was part of the pietist movement. And sometimes we think of the word pietism as not a very good word these days, but the pietists were the really kind of devout uh, Lutheran Christians. So Lutheranism had kind of fallen into kind of cold intellectualism uh, to become a very a very uh, um, cold or dead kind of faith. People were Lutheran culturally more than anything else. And yet within within that area of Europe, the, there were Lutherans who actually became what we might say today is filled with the spirit and, and energized by their faith and uh, devoutly in love with Christ and committed to prayer and Bible study and care for the poor. And Zinzendorf was born into a family of pietists and he becomes deeply touched by Christ, um, so much so that he wants to give up his his work as a part of the landed aristocracy and become a mission, become a minister. And his family, who obviously were very sympathetic to this because they shared his same uh, uh, devotion to Christ, were also like, "Whoa, but you, you can't like step out of the family line. Like that's that's your destiny. Like you 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 will take on the the." Um, the leadership of this family. And so I love this, the way God works in this guy's life because he's torn between wanting to fulfill his obligations to his family and the estate and to wanting to preach the gospel. Um, and in his early life, it's a real wrench. Uh, he just doesn't want to be going to the coronations of kings and uh, sitting around with other counts and earls. He wants to go out and preach the Bible and then God answers this prayer in the. I mean, who could? I mean, you could write this like this bunch of Moravian refugees from you know, Moravia would be like what we would today call the Czech Republic or Slovakia, um, escaping persecution themselves, travel onto his estate, and it was standard practice in those days for the landed aristocracy who had huge tracts of land that if refugees landed on your estate and asked permission to kind of squat there, it's like, well, of course, that's what we Christian royalty do. So they build a village in this, in the on his own estate, his huge, you know, vast tracts of land. And then he starts hanging out with them and they are full of the spirit. They love Jesus. They've been persecuted uh, uh, back in Moravia and they've come here for freedom of religion. But they are a hot mess, Joshua. Like they are just, there's inter arguments between them. The leadership is like at war with other people. I mean, they're just like, they love Jesus, but what a mess. And he realizes they don't really know their Bibles terribly well. And so this is how this conundrum between, I want to be a you know member of the aristocracy and I want to teach the Bible, that's how it's resolved. He becomes essentially the pastor to this village on his own property. So he maintains his his position as the Count of Zinzendorf, but he also essentially becomes the pastor. Essentially, effectively, he ends up as the full-time pastor of the Moravian community. He's teaching them the Bible and pietism, pietistic kind of principles. They are infecting him with this you know, extraordinary garrulous love of Christ. And then there is a kind of Moravian Pentecost that happens in this village one time where after, you know, his teaching and after, you know, worship, there's this just combustible experience of the presence of God where, where people are overwhelmed. Some people like like fall down, but there's an incredible sense of um, God's presence and deep, deep connection to Christ and each other. And it transforms the Moravian community. It sets off what becomes like a hundred year prayer meeting. I mean, they devote themselves to prayer there's this refreshment, this renewal, all the old enmity or the kind of squabbles that were happening are all washed away. Uh, Zinzendorf himself is overwhelmed by this. And as a result of it, pietism was often about kind of personal devotion, but this becomes communal devotion. And the communal devotion then results in this sense like, whoa, this should, 
we should take this elsewhere. We should we should go out into the world and share this. And this was not like the way a lot of people were thinking at that time. It becomes a spirit-led missionary movement. And in the end, Moravians end up traveling all around the world. Zinzendorf himself travels overseas to preach the gospel. Uh, uh, I mean, in fact, the way the cult mission movement from Moravians start is that uh, uh, Zinzendorf is at the coronation of the of the king, and he meets a freed Caribbean slave who's converted to Christianity and has come to this event and says to Zinzendorf, haven't you got a community of spirit-filled people? Could you send some of them our way? And so away they go, like to the West Indies and places like that, and then beyond. Even to my country of Australia, Mor Moravians have come here and established missions. And I mean, in the book, I point out a whole bunch of kind of principles of Moravian mission, which were, you know, beautiful, spirit-led mission, devotion to Christ. Uh, they had no interest in setting up their own denomination or their own kind of churches. They would often land somewhere, convert people, and then hand them over to the Presbyterians or the Methodists or the Anglicans or whatever the case may be. They weren't empire building. They were kind of like, like they were like water. They were seeping into every nook and cranny of a particular context and bringing life and hope. And as you just pointed out earlier in the question with Pete Gregg and uh, the 24-7 prayer meeting, inspiring people to to this day to reconnect this idea of pietism, although we don't often call it that these days, of prayer and a mission and concern for the poor. And it's just an extraordinary story. Looking over their values and what you, you learned, I think one is first fruits. Who are the people that are open and hungry mm -hmm. to Jesus? So I'm trying to send missionaries out. One of the things that we, we teach is that we're looking for people that the Father is already drawing. Uh, our job is to walk alongside God as he's bringing people to himself. And so we're finding those people, the Moravians did that. Indigenous leadership, they were trying to raise up local leaders. Yep. Um, it wasn't about them. The Moravians are an inspiration to me um, and many others. And now as we take uh, the spirit with us, that we could be spirit led uh, and not just have a box and say, this is the way that we do things. Put this box somewhere else, yeah, um, yeah. I think is really important for us going forward. Since we've talked a lot about about men, um, <laughs> let's look at, because there's a, a wonderful, wonderful women that have been in this missions movement. You highlight a lot of them in the freedom fighting shape that you have. Um, and one of the things, as you talk about these women, you say this, this is, I and I laughed out loud. Their extraordinary achievement was not simply in being female, but in courageously obeying Christ's call to spread the gospel. So these are amazing women, but they're amazing people of God that would go out and do that. Um, could you talk a little bit about Mary Slessor? I think Mary Slessor is pretty uh, inspirational yeah. to me. Yeah, and that that quote about that their, their achievement wasn't being in women was that um, at that time, people started to triumph, uh, trumpet this kind of, oh, the single woman missionary, and, and Mary Slessor is an example of that, Lilius Trotter and uh, Lottie Moon, there's a whole bunch of them. And um, it was kind of like, whoa, that's a thing to be a single woman missionary. And it's like, hold on, they weren't being a woman missionary. <laughs> they were women being missionaries. Um, but yeah, Mary Slessor was, oh man, she was like a, force of nature, that woman. I mean, she um, she was a very inspired by, she was a Scottish woman, very inspired by another Scot, a man called David Livingston. And David Livingston, I think, is probably one of the world's worst missionaries. I mean, uh, he wasn't much of a missionary, to be quite honest. And, but, and yet, somehow, God used him to inspire a whole generation of people. That's a whole other story, Joshua. I, I mean, the way history gets written and who gets lauded, and yet somehow God still uses that, even though it's not strictly true. Mary Slessor heard all about him, thought, I want to do that, went to, I guess what we call modern-day Nigeria, and was told, I mean, 
don't go up that river. Like, don't go inland there. I mean, stick to the coast. Even there, there's no place for a single woman, but definitely don't go inland. And I admit she was just indefatigable. It's like, I think I will go up that river. And I mean, she was known for the certain peculiarities. She had red hair. She didn't wear shoes wherever she went. So people would look at this and think, who is this? Like colonial women were like dressed to the nines and uh, and well presented. I'm not saying she wasn't well presented, but uh, seeing a, a, a pale skinned, red headed woman with no shoes striding through the jungle, it was like, what is this? Uh, and one of the things she ends up inadvertently doing, I mean, she's there to preach the gospel, but she ends up discovering that there's a practice uh, in this part of uh, of Africa where twins are considered to be um, a curse. So the ancient gods or certain spirits or ancestor spirits have cursed this this woman by putting two children in her. And so twins were left out into the jungle. I mean, they were just put in the jungle to die, um, lest they bring the curse upon the village. So she happens upon this and is astonished by it and so collects them um, and yet still continues her missionary work. And so in the book, I say, just try and imagine this pale-skinned, red-headed woman rowing a boat to the upper reaches of these, like, completely unreached uh, parts of Africa, unreached by, by, by colonial Europeans, with a boat full of kids in tow. And I mean, like, this is how people would describe it. She'd come with a baby on one hip and another kid by the hand, followed by two or three or four other children, I mean, just because it's like, I'm not building a family. Like, what else am I to do? I mean, these children need to be cared for. And then in the end, of course, she collects so many that she ends up building what we would today call an orphanage. And one of the things I say in the book is that we often kind of look at Mary Slessor and people like her. Amy Carmichael in India did something similar in terms of rescuing young girls and then later young boys is we become obsessed with the orphanage. It's like, oh, right, let's do that. Let's go start orphanages. I mean, the best place for children is to be raised, if not in their their immediate family, but in their extended family, to, to maintain a sense of story, a sense of identity, a sense of history, language, all of those things. Then pull kids out and put them in orphanages. That would be the you know, absolutely last resort. And yet, because of Mary Slessor and Amy Carmichael and people like that, the West became obsessed with the orphanage, even up until into now well into the you know 20th and 21st centuries. It's like, oh, build an orphanage, take photos of that, all the happy kids and send them back. And it's like, no, no, no. The only reason Mary Slessor did this is that they were abandoned in the jungle to be eaten by wild animals. I mean, she does it as an emergency activity and she doesn't take them out of their contexts. Um, she's living right there in the context, just pr protecting and caring for these children. I mean, she was astonishing. And I, I think that, I mean, as were those other women that I mentioned too. I mean, another one I really love is not a single woman, but in that book, I tell the story of um, Alice Seeley Harris, who takes a camera to the Congo. I find that story extraordinary. I mean, somebody in the late 1800s, Somebody says to her, oh, you're going to the Congo as a missionary here. Take this newfangled thing. It's called a personal camera. I mean, there were cameras around, but, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures where the cameraman has like a camera on a tripod with a big sheet over him and a huge flash. I mean, no one was carrying those things around. But but someone had come across like a, a, a portable or a personal camera. And how innovative is this? They say to her, why don't you take some photos of mission life and send them back. I mean, Joshua, that's what every missionary does now. <laughs> but this was like innovative, like, wow, crazy, like take some photos and send them back. And so she does. And yet she gets drawn into, I mean, hell on earth. When they get there, her and her husband, John, uh, they discover that in the Belgian part of the Congo, uh, there's a genocide going on, being perpetrated by a private army of the uh, the the King of Belgium. I mean, it's just one of the most despicable, horrible stories of, of rampant colonialism at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, we don't even know how many millions of people died as a result of this. And one of the things that this private army would do is that if the Congolese didn't 
collect enough rubber, they had to make up their quota by having a limb removed and added to the weight. And so she starts encountering people with, you know, one hand or one arm or and then discovers this is what's going on. And this intrepid missionary woman, and there are pictures of her that, that are taken on her camera. She's she's the classic missionary woman with the hat and the full dressed in white, you know, with high heels, you know, tramping around in the, the jungle. I mean, she's the stereotype of the colonial missionary woman. But she decides someone has to document this. And so she regularly goes into the Belgian area of the Congo against the law, if she were to be caught by the force publique, this private army, she would be in all sorts of trouble. But she is taking portraits of people with one arm, one leg, um, a terrible scarring. And then her and her husband take these these photos back to the UK and eventually to America. And they give public lectures and they create such outrage. It's one of the first kind of viral human rights movements that eventually the, pub, the parliament of of Belgium shuts the whole thing down and and King Leopold is forced to end his uh, nefarious activities there and then dies of natural causes shortly after. I mean, that guy should have been tried as a, as a war criminal, so well, not even a war criminal, as a, as a criminal. But I love this story. She just went there to preach the gospel and the shape of mission for her ends up becoming uh, determined by the genocide that she finds herself on the doorstep of. And she doesn't say, well, that's none of my business. I'm here to kind of teach the Bible to to people uh, here on the Angola River. No, she decides this is God's shape for me. And for some reason, someone gave me this newfangled thing. I'm going to use it to actually bring about freedom and peace in this particular community. I mean, I love her story. She just is a remarkable hero, actually. She's uh, she's pretty incredible. You know, I highly recommend people to go out and get Missions is the Shape of Water. Read through all of the shapes that that Michael Frost writes about in his book. Um, and so go do that. And I love that you you highlight people and have inspiration and story, but also caution of what what we have done poorly and how we can do better moving forward. But I'd love to talk a little bit about today and today's mission. As you read the history of, of mission, if you wrote this book, what did you find for us today as we're moving mission forward and we are continuing to partner with God and what he's doing around the world? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. That's essentially the whole point of the book is what, I mean, some people love history and they love stories. And so it's like, oh, I just love hearing about all of that. But really the point of studying history is in order to look at patterns and not to repeat them and not to go back and say, oh, I wish we were back in the days of this or that, but rather to say, having viewed how different Christians throughout different eras of history have been shaped by their contexts and have been faithful to the gospel, what is our current context? What what what's the container into which we're pouring mission? And you know, Christians are used to sort of thinking about all the terrible things that are happening in the world, and there are themes and trends in society today that we need to resist and be concerned about. There's no question about that. But in what ways? Are we on the doorstep of a genocide in, in the Belgian Congo? Or to what degree are we engaging with the issue of slavery? Or to what degree are we actually responding to uh, um, an agrarian society in Southern Africa, which is being attacked by the Boers and the Zulus? Like, like let's observe the context. And then what challenge are we being called into? And I think that there are lots of interesting trends and themes, and I outline them toward the end of the book, where I feel like there's an incredible movement toward the democratization of leadership. Uh, what we're seeing now is this kind of emergence of um, of very young people leaving, leading global movements like Malala, uh, you sort of say, uh, like Greta Thunberg, people like that. Whether you like, you know, everything that they say or do is not the point. The point is actually what we're now seeing is grassroots movements bubbling up, often led by very young, passionate people. And this is offering us a shape. This is asking us, 
Does the gospel have something to say to this? And I would definitely think it does. That, In fact, what we've discovered throughout history is this is the way the gospel moves, not from the top down, not from the powerful, um, not from those uh, with, uh, with lots of autonomy and access, but actually from listening to the voices of the marginal or the poor or the young and from recognising actually movements emerge this way in really significant ways. So I think that churches, I mean, I think that, that Christians ought to see that mission ought to have something to say about uh, creation care and about issues to do with climate change, ought to have concerns about uh, the role of women and the protection of women. And uh, I know that this is a triggering kind of phrase for a lot of people, but a toxic kind of masculinity, which does orient men toward um, control and command and even violence. And I feel like, uh, I'm not saying all men are violent. I am saying that actually here, listen to things like the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter. These You don't have to join the whole movement or agree with everything that these movements are about, but they are shaping our world. And if we ask ourselves, does the gospel have anything to say about racial reconciliation and justice? Of course it does. Does it have anything to say about the valuing of women as equal to men? Of course it does. Anything to say about care for the environment? Of course it does. And it's about us being willing to listen to the context as it's demanding a new world and a better world. And there are lots of very positive themes there that are emerging. Uh, kind of leaderless uh, 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 movements uh, are happening all around the world. I mean, we saw it at Asbury with the recent kind of Asbury revival. It was, uh, if it's a revival or awakening or whatever we call it. I mean, when people ask the students at Asbury, like, you know, who's in charge? It looks like like there's organisation here. You're wheeling in whiteboards and you're writing prayer requests on. And there are band, you know, the band, the, the worship band is being replenished by new people. And it's like there's organisation here. So who's in charge? And the answer was no one. Like this is how movements occur these days. There isn't a, yeah. a big kahuna in charge of this. It's it's not a man who's running this thing. It is like organic. It's like water bubbling up. And so, again, we need to look at this shape. There's something really interesting going on here, which is asking us to reconsider what mission might look like. Um, there are a lot of command and control men who are used to the old days back in the late 20th century where men started organisations with top-down leadership. They had objectives and goals, and they proceeded forward to, to, uh, to facilitate them. Well, that was the shape back then, but I don't think that's what the shape will look like uh, in our current day or, or moving forward. I think a rediscovery of the power of, of prayer and of the kind of chaotic organic movements that we see happening that emerge out of those kinds of things. A rediscovery of the fullness of the gospel. As I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's not just good news about how Jesus died for your sins, not to minimize that as part of the, the good news, but it is also about the reign of God, which is about joy and justice and healing and peacemaking and the, 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 a renewed sense of family or community and the very presence of God, um, to discover the fullness of that and all the ethics related to that. Um, I think our world is demanding imperfectly, no, no question, but demanding a world of equality and justice, creation care, respect for the marginalised, respect for other cultures, multi-generational, multi-ethnic community. Now, they're not getting it right. They're getting it wrong in all sorts of ways. But that yearning there is actually a yearning for the very things that the kingdom is all about. And we need to take that seriously and shape mission accordingly. Amen. Uh, incredible thoughts uh, there at the end. Uh, I would love to, to sit and talk with you for a long time about this, but we are out of time. But I would love for, for you to tell people how... Can they uh, get your book, Mission is the Shape of Water, uh, and connect with you and anything else you'd like to say uh, to people? Uh, well, you can get this book at Amazon, both on Kindle and as a paperback. Uh, my website is mikefrost.net, and there is a free, uh, you can read the prologue to the book for free there if you want, and then there's a link from that to the Amazon page. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love it if uh, if people... I grabbed hold of this book. I mean, I when I was writing this book, Joshua, someone, a colleague said to me, oh, what's, your, what's this book? I was like, 
This book is about mission and about history. And they're the two things most people don't want to read books about. And so <laughs> I don't know that anyone's ever going to read this book. And so as you said, that you're hearing lots of people are reading it. I've just been delighted just how, how people have really taken to this book. So I was not expecting it to be super popular. So it's been a great surprise to me. It is absolutely fantastic. And uh, we've already had conversations about uh, putting it into our training program and our internship for new missionaries as well. Um, so we'll be referring back to this uh, quite a bit uh, going forward. So I just want to say thank you for your work. Um, and this, and thank you for your voice of saying, let's bring the the kingdom to know that the kingdom of God uh, is here, it's available, um, and we could join God in his mission as he unveils it and brings all peoples to himself. So thank you so oh, much. Thank Mike. you, Joshua, for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.